Welcome to the show. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Riley. And today, we're discussing Denis Villeneuve's 2016 sci-fi flick, Arrival. We'll laugh, we'll argue, we might get a little too into it, but at the end of the day, just movies. <laughs> Spoiler alert! <laughs> Not an exception, <laughs> right? Yeah, well, th- but that's kind of what the aliens sound like. Well, that's where Hans Zimmer got the sound. He that's talked to these aliens exactly. and he was like, whoa, he's, they sound amazing. Honestly, with Hans yeah. Zimmer, I believe it. I believe <laughs> it. You know how much of my being is resisting listening to this Dune soundtrack? Oh, it's really? a billable on streaming. Yeah, oh, yeah, why would you do that? I don't do it. Seeing it. I'm not. I'm yeah, not. Good, I haven't listened to it. Just ignore it. Forget about it. I want to yeah. listen to Wipe it. Wipe it from your mind. Anyways, <laughs> next week we're doing No Time to Die. Woo! Woo! Please send us your questions to our email what you want us to talk about in that movie. But until then, today, we're doing Arrival. There is time to die. (laughs) We're going to die next week. (laughs) All right, David, what are you giving Arrival out of 10? Arrival captures the entirety of my imagination by using aliens to communicate a near fathomless message of humanity, hope, and how languages connect us. The absolute best first contact movie ever. Mm. 9.6 out of 10. 9.6? This movie is fucking phenomenal. Wow. Wow. Nice. Let's go. It Put is it on. so there, there. fucking good. You better hype. No, no spoilers for your <laughs> slogan, but you better be high five. <laughs> you're, you're entitled to your own opinion, Riley. Whatever. What are you giving uh, out of 10? I loved how you pulled that back at the last second a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, I'm glad I perceive time as linear because if I didn't, it would have ruined the surprise of Arrival being one of the best science fiction films of all time. Who's on voice? Okay, low 10. This movie. <laughs> Oh, thank you. You didn't even you, you interrupted my Abbott and Costello joke, oh. which was not very funny. Okay. I'm giving it a nine out of ten just because I don't do the granularity that sure. that, that uh, David does. I'm that. getting a proximity high. My my rating might just climb up a little <laughs> bit. Here. Oh my gosh, what is it, James? Ah, uh, walking out of the theater in 2016, and you better believe I was enhanced. I <laughs> thought it was the best sci-fi film since Contact. I thought it was amazing. Repeat, repeat viewings are a little less mind blowing. Oh, um, what? well, you know, it's a movie with a twist. Yeah. You know the twist. It's Fair. not as good the second time. Oh man, still a must watch. I love this movie. Nine out of ten. Yeah. Dang, it's amazing. Wow, three nines out. Well, nine point six. But yeah. I have a quibble. I have a quibble. We can get to eventually. I have some quibbles. Yeah, but, yeah. but, but they're just quibbles. But interestingly, one of my anti quibbles is the very thing you just said. I think it's, it gets better with repeat viewings. Interesting. Yeah. I'd right. like to know all about that right after this message from our sponsor, ah! Manscaped. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels, including their fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. Its new wireless charging system removes the need to bring cables with you and is compatible with most cheap charging pads. The Lawnmower 4.0 also includes ceramic blades with skin safe tech, reducing nicks and cuts. It's cordless, waterproof, and gets 90 minutes of use on a full charge. So head to manscaped.com slash carpool20 and get 20% off and free shipping today. We're also brought to you by Privet, Privet, Privet Internet Access VPN. Private internet access helps you hide your true IP address so that you can bypass your restrictions and censorship. You can connect up to 10 devices at once, and it includes an internet kill switch. <laughs> if your VPN gets disconnected involuntarily, you can't use the same sound <laughs> well, for both of these. There's no other sound. PIA is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and even as a Chrome extension in your lo- non-linear life. So check it out at lmg.gg slash carpool critics. The only the only character that dies in this movie is her daughter, and I'm not gonna do it like a, a child joke dying about that. that. Exhale. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, Carpool Critics is finally supported by Vessi Footwear, famous for making shoes that are light, comfortable, and most importantly, waterproof. They're made from a dual climate knit material. They're easy to pack. They're 100 percent vegan, and they got a new one coming out soon that we're all gonna be wearing. That's Ooh. not it, is it? How did no. you get yours so soon? No, this isn't That's the, new the old one. one. That's okay. a good one. Woo! Uh, I like mine because they're just super easy to slip on and off, and it's hard to find slip-ons these days. Ooh. Head to vesti.com slash carpoolcritics and get $25 off right now using a, a, a code that has our old name in it. They're just movies. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're called. <laughs> the codes haven't caught up. Oh, man. Imagine All right. if I did have the new ones, though. You guys would be so jealous. It would huh. be over for you. I'm just imagining it. This time around, <laughs> huh? this is only my, second of- like my first official rewatch of this yeah. film, and I was interested to see... All right, since I know the twist and everything, what am I going to see? What am I going to... Because the beginning of the film, what it would be like Act 1 introducing this character to us mm-hmm. is is what we think is a flashback is actually the future. So that means it's really not part of her character at the beginning of the movie. So no. the the answer to the question, who is she at the beginning of the yeah. movie? What changes will she undergo? What what like character flaws does she have that must change? That's a totally different thing in your mind in the rewatch. So I was looking out for that. Right. No, I mean, we're definitely like... 
we see her following that flashback and we're like, oh, she's so sad because her daughter just died or, or, or died at some time in the past, right? We, we're assuming that this thing has already happened. Yeah, it's interesting because when you're writing that character, you know that the twist exists. You know that the way she behaves after that premonition flashback thing, yeah. the way she behaves after it has to be consistent with what we just saw yep. to, tr- to trick us. Yep. And so they went with, I guess, she's not... She's kind of a depressive person who really has nothing to live for. She's just kind of chill, you know? She lives to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she lives to work, and she also just, like, likes solitude. We see her, like, living in her house by Ball herself. house? Yeah, it's a really nice house. On I a mean, teacher's salary? She's, she's a, well, and she's worked with the army, I guess, before, so maybe, I'm assuming, maybe they compensated her for that. But what school does she work at? Like, is that, I believe that house, if it's in buttfuck and where. Nowhere. It did. Whoa. I mean, yeah. well, I, I guess did, I uh, censored the, uh, oh, no. a word that wasn't a swear, and then I s- just swore. <laughs> way I imagine that. But f nowhere. <laughs> I I imagine that it must be close to Montana. It's g- given that like there were jets flying around and stuff at the university, so I'm assuming that it was it wasn't across the whole country. Hmm. Must have been somewhere close to where I don't even know where Montana this is. Not is. The important Middle part America. Me. No, Montana is uh, by the Alberta border. But I think I think to me. Oh, okay. You could make the argument that, like, uh, just because the movie is presented in a semi-linear fashion, like, that's part of, I think, the the bigger idea of it. That, like, we, are, as the audience, are experiencing linearly. But as you understand that, like, really, the movie is a big circle, like, you are, like, it kind of just changes how I experience that moment. Yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. It is kind of meta because the this twist relies on certain conventions. It really shines a light mm-hmm. on how we have all these conventions that we might not even know yeah. like we expect that the first thing we see in a movie is either present or sometimes past yep never the future and if it is the future then we're going to get something that's like five days earlier yeah. or something like that uh, and because we assume that w- this whole central conceit of this movie is based on that yep. but it's just hiding in plain sight well yeah. and i think something the movie does really good really well early on is it actually it kind of shines a light on the audience's relationship with the movie. Well, the first shot is just that big pan down of her and her house. And it's a very similar setup to how uh, it'll be inside of the alien's ship, where it's like a, 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 a glass window at this running perpendicular to the axis of the camera. Yeah. And it's like a view into another world in the same way that the audience is per- perpendicular to the screen with a window into that world. And there's so I think some, hmm. there's an element of that where, yeah, the movie, it's like the, uh, the audience experience is exactly presented like the language of the 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 the, the aliens yeah, and this tight harmonious this movie it's so this tight. movie is so tight it's so good in fact we should probably remember exactly what happens oh, in it I, oh, I forgot about you i know you did <laughs> hey here's what happens when giant alien spacecraft appear over 12 locations across the globe the u.s military recruits linguist louise banks and physicist ian donnelly to study the craft above montana on board, Louise and Ian dub the two giant squid-like aliens they meet heptopods and nickname them Abbott and Costello. As the two experts learn about the heptopods' written language, which uses a non-linear structure, Louise begins to have visions of her daughter who died at, day- at age 12 from an incurable illness. Eventually, Louise is able to ask the heptopods why they have come, to which the aliens reply, offer weapon. China interprets the phrase as use weapon and halts communications, while rogue U.S. soldiers plant a bomb in the alien craft. Unaware of this, Louise and Ian re-enter the ship. Abbott gives them a more complex message, then ejects them just before the bomb explodes. Studying the message, Ian discovers it is one of 12 pieces meant to be shared by the nations of Earth. As China declares war on the aliens, Louise goes alone into the craft, where Costello tells her Abbott is death process, and explains they have come to help humanity because in 3,000 years, they will need humanity's help. Louise realizes the weapon is their language, which allows humans to perceive time non-linearly. And the visions of her daughter aren't memories, but premonitions of the future. Using a stolen satellite phone, Louise calls General Shang's private number of China, which she remembers being given by Shang at a future United Nations event, and persuades him to call off the attack by reciting his wife's dying words. China and the other nations stand down and release their portions of the 12-part message, and the heptopods leave Earth. Ian expresses his love for Louise, who now knows that she will have a child with him, despite knowing the child's fate, and that Ian will leave after Louise reveals that she knew this. They embrace, and Louise remarks that she forgot how good it felt to be held by him before they even got together. Uh, It's a great line. I like that line. I think there's like a Carly Rae Jepsen song 
similar to that. <laughs> I just met you in 10 days. And if no, there isn't, the- missed opportunity. <laughs> get on it, Carly. Yeah. Get on it. Uh, I want to start like with the details of this movie. Because like yeah. we can talk about like the big macro weird thematic stuff. But this movie gets the atmosphere so mm. right. Yeah. You heard from the beginning, like when she's teaching at the school and this one cell phone goes off and it's like, okay, it's annoying. And then another one goes off and like it starts building. Oh, like, that's the most Ooh. fun part of any contact yeah. movie or pandemic totally. movie. Totally. Yeah. Like, oh no. You're just like, something is happening. Big it changes. Yeah, it can, honestly... you turn the, can you turn on the news? <laughs> You're like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah. oh. It felt, I mean, it felt a bit more uh, poignant now as well, being in a pandemic and kind of like yeah. living through all this crazy stuff. But uh, yeah. yeah, they get the they get the ambiance so right, and I feel like uh, we were already kind of talking about her characterization early on. But but it's 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 crazy because it works so well compared to the montage that opens it up, and we see that her daughter died. But then we see her, and she's like this like chill person, as we were saying. Mm-hmm. She's kind of like a depressive person. But like that to me is super important because it works on both levels. Like we believe that she is sad because of her daughter dying because this is the start of her arc. And her arc is I I don't tell me if I'm wrong about this guys. Her arc is going from like low proactivity to like fear like she's feeling fear about uh, going out into the world and accomplishing something. She like she isn't in, about, about like risking stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. And then her arc, uh, she she learns to embrace life and kind of like face it with courage. Yeah, I would agree. I think the theme overall is it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved at all. So mm-hmm. I guess at the beginning That's of the one movie, way of putting it, yeah. Yeah, because that's the big question at the end, right? Like, should I conti- should I enter a romantic relationship with Ian and have a child, even if that marriage is going to end? Yeah, and that child is going to die. But see, now this is the question. This is the, we're getting into the sci-fi lore stuff because should does she have a choice? Because I was like, because mm. I think I think I was asking like the whole time. This is my third watch through. Sort of, I had like a half of a second watch because I like put it on the background of all playing with yeah. my baby. Oh, I had one of those too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, it wasn't a baby thing. I just like came home. For, sometimes when I come home from like partying or out, yeah, I come, and I'm just like Ugh, I stumble onto the couch and just put on a good movie. Put you know? on some high for like art. twenty minutes. I pass <laughs> yeah. out. Show me the there will be blood monologue. <laughs> the milk Make me feel milk good check. about life. Um, e- what were we saying? <laughs> this is your third watch, and there's something to do with the. Uh, chronology of the movie oh does will. she have a choice oh, yeah. does so the whole time i'm like why would she still have the kid knowing that the kid is gonna die like i think because it's better to have loved and lost yeah. well but it's also she has to is it rude to the kid to like because i because to me i'm like <laughs> rude <laughs> <laughs> i don't know what you mean though it's like is it is fair it, to the kid is it moral to, is this yeah. an abortion have, argument well are we arguing no, abortion we're not, now we're not <laughs> I, we're not arguing abortion but what i'm saying is that if you know that, because like, it's one thing to have a kid and hope that their life is is uh, is good, you know. There are antinatalists who like don't believe in having children who are like, "How dare you like, fling me from the void? I was perfectly exactly. comfortable." Yeah. Exactly <laughs> because they're like, "Life the is all, all, life is just pain, and with like small bits of happiness, maybe." But on those the whole, people have it's not pain. listened to this podcast. <laughs> mm. So, like, you know, they believe you shouldn't have children. But I think that if you're gonna have kids. You might be like, all right, life has a lot of suffering in it, but you might have some fulfillment. You might find something good along the way. You might accomplish something. You might be, you might serve as an example to other people. You might contribute to society. So in do you some think way. she's being selfish? Well, this is the question: is that if she has choice, um, I feel like maybe it is a bit selfish. I, I, and at the very least, I can't understand why she would go ahead. But I feel like the movie is kind of saying that this is a deterministic universe. And that she doesn't have a choice. Is it saying that? Because we know, and this is actually, I didn't want to talk about this for way longer, but like, the <laughs> thing that I hate about this movie the most oh, no. of, is is the scene where she talks to Shang and, and he's like, hey, that thing in the past, I'm going to give you what you need for that now and here in the future. See, but yeah, that, that indicates to me that it's deterministic. But it seems like she has, but, but she has choices though, because when she, you can see her later on in the movie, uh, we're back at the premonitions, but she's occupying that in real time yeah. it's not like a memory she's 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 yeah. there yeah and yeah. she's in control yeah and she's she's she looks like quote she's, unquote control she's clueless talking to shang being like oh really yeah. why don't yeah 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 why don't you tell me okay but, but if we're going to be talking about determinism free will we got to define our terms here because determinism doesn't mean that you don't have the illusion of choice and that you don't feel like you have choice like she obviously has a quote-unquote choice but the question is whether 
the events that transpire as a in in this movie could be altered if if like could uh, Louise have not had the kid? Could she have not called General Shang? You know, because but, because but, I think but, that dude, the, the way that, that you've set this up, which is the correct way, it's unknowable because yes. all we all we know is that she believes she could have not called Shang. She believes well, she has the, the reason, choice. The reason it's important is because Louise has this nonlinear view of time and we don't. So it's like she might be experiencing all moments in time simultaneously. She might have a nonlinear perspective of time now, which seems to indicate that even if she wanted to not have the kid, even if she was like, whoa, that is immoral to have a, have a kid that's going to die at, at 12 uh, and you can't stop it. She might not have been able to actually do anything about it because the fact that she's having these visions of the future of her daughter dying means that it's inevitable yeah. and that it will happen. It is. It is. It seems deterministic because, uh, like you said, she has the same premonitions all the time. Yeah. Their language system is 2D. It's not like like they're giving you a 2D circle. It's like this is what's going to happen. Yeah. It's not like a stack like you see at the end of um, Interstellar, mm, where it's yeah, you know yeah. here's all these possible things going back. It's not like she's got these options like in Dune where she can, you know, she can see the probabilities. Right. It's it's just, oh, fucking Dune, man, it's coming. Um, <laughs> it's uh, It seems just like, yeah, that's what's going to happen. But at the same time, maybe I think like, she does. The character seems to struggle, though, right? She's. Uh, I think she seems to struggle, but I think that ultimately that is her arc. Like in the beginning, she's kind of, she seems sort of anxiety ridden a little bit. And she's like. You know, there's fear there, and at the end, she is she's at peace. You know, she's like she's in she's encountering this and and experiencing these realities, and just being like, "That's life." You know, that's it's it's yeah, it's, acceptance. It's horrible. It's uh, tied to the Nietzschean idea. I feel like of amor fate, love of fate. You just accept. I feel uh, like this life. is one of the like secondary questions of the movie. I don't think it's like one of the primary drives. I think that the determinism is kind of built into the medium, where mm. because. We know what happens. It's she knows what happens, and she has to stick to it. There is no freedom because right. it's a pre-recorded format. Oh so yeah, I, think I guess you're right. You bring, you bring in a lot of that interpretation of of like uh, of determinism yourself, just because of the relationship you have with the art. The, so, yeah. So the problem is that this is based on a short story, not a choose your own adventure. Yes. If it was a video game, <laughs> we could answer these questions. And there is movies that you can do more uh, an element of free will, like something like Mister Nobody. I think does an effective job of simulating the feeling of like eternal or infinite possibilities or whatever yeah. but uh i will say though that one of the screenwriters uh was uh, there he, he was interviewed and he said specifically that in the short story uh the daughter dies in a rock climbing accident and he's like that seemed but like uh louise still doesn't save her because it's like determinism she Ooh. she like you know yeah. it's, it's established but he's like i don't like that That's i want she was her older i believe too i think she was a teenager yeah like that yeah happened. they made her die younger in this one and the screenwriter says, I don't like that idea. I don't like, I don't want this to be deterministic. I want Louise to have the choice because it, it establishes that she is choosing to accept life and choosing to uh, uh, embrace fate in a certain way, you know? And so uh, he said, in, in the screenwriter's mind, it seemed like he was like, they have a choice. And they changed the rock climbing accident to an incurable illness mm -hmm. because you can't do anything to stop an incurable illness. Like she could just stop her from going on the yeah. rock climbing thing or whatever. Yeah. So... It seems like the screen, one of the screen, I forget which one it was. Uh, but, I think I listened to that podcast too. Yeah? Yeah. Um, I saw ago. a clip yeah. of it. I don't know. Um, I also think it's way more powerfully powerful emotionally where like most of us have some kind of sad hospital experience we can tie to. And if, like, even if you don't have a kid that has died, like right. you have some connection to what that is. Whereas if like it's her standing on a cliff and her daughter falls off, you're like, that is sad, but I have no... Yeah. Like, I have no experience. It's not personally. as dramatic. No. And in fact, I, I remember now why I listened to that podcast. is because there's a Beyond the sc not, uh Lessons from the Screenplay yeah. uh, YouTube video about this. And the, it, the video is about adaptation. And he references this particular podcast. And I listened to the whole podcast. Mm. It was a couple of years ago now. Oh, but okay. what I took away from that podcast is how... It was a, it's a masterful adaptation. They changed a lot of stuff. Yeah. In the, in the short story, the aliens don't even come to Earth. No. Uh, they're and just then the, orbiting the, around. The screenwriter said, like, we can't make a whole movie... Uh, based on Zoom calls, yeah, where they they're just on the yeah. phone with the aliens. Like, wow, there are a number of like interesting changes they made to the uh, from from the short story to the screenplay that like illustrate uh, what you need to do to make a movie work, uh, as opposed to like a written thing. 
Also, Eric Heiserer, I think. I guess he's the main screenwriter. And then Ted Chang had a credit because he's the author of the short story. Mm, yeah. It's Eric Heiserer saying all that stuff. Anyways, language. What do, what do you want to... Do you want to talk about something else, David? I wanted David? to talk about the, uh, the first image, like the first word dialogue that we hear in the in the whole story is i used to think this was the beginning of your story and it's Whoa. like it's just so <laughs> again it's so integrated into the all the themes and all the yeah. plot and how it's all gonna go google circles yeah. you're like man yeah. you know what amy adams i used to think it was the beginning of the movie too now i know <laughs> no. this is the end yeah it's, yeah oh it's so brilliant and I, but i found something really effective in the movie i mean we we will spend some time talking about language but by the end of the movie, I felt like I had such a different relationship with the words that were coming out of people's mouth. Like the movie does a lot of, of work to take the focus off of sometimes like the body language or the expression and putting it on the words. Like there's a lot of shots where they purposely obscure people's faces. Yeah, in the climax. Uh, yeah, and it's like it, normally in a movie you would give them, you would want the actor's performance and their emotion, but they choose to focus on the language, which again, super fucking tightly integrated. Mm. And it works. Like the, the words are so powerful. Yeah, I I, can't. I thought I was going to bring that up because that's an interesting choice. It's uh, the scene I'm thinking about is when Ian and uh, what's her name? Louise. Louise are they're staring at the sunset, waiting for their helicopters yeah. out of there, and that's when he's like professing his love to yeah. her. And, and it's like a really from behind French over, like you just get like the back of their heads. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, I had such an interesting bold choice, but it really works with the theme. Yeah, of it. I I I I read or heard that uh, Denis Villeneuve uh, told the cinematographer to not be afraid to make things like boring looking. Yeah. Where he's like, I don't think he said like, make it boring, but he was like, you know, uh, don't be, don't, don't worry about making things like more colorful or like making sure the skin tones are all right or whatever. Like, yeah. don't be afraid to just like make it look drab and really ridiculous. natural, which looking. is weird because I think that normally that kind of bothers me in a movie. Like I want things to, like I don't know, I I I I think that the average person probably doesn't love looking at grays and monotone, yeah. weird like lame stuff, you know, for for two hours. But how long, how long is this movie? Two hours, almost two hours? exact, almost at the minute. Yeah, great length, by the way. Yes, um, love that length. But but it was like it does <laughs> such a good job because it's like we're not about the flash here, we're not about the pomp, we're yeah. just about like it 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 really telegraphs to you that this movie is about substance. Yeah. And there is meat there, but like get into it. It's because like you could make a very similar looking movie and it would not connect with you no. emotionally. But this movie, it, they're in total control of everything. Like the, mm. the use of warm and cold to be like, okay, she's worn down now. We're giving you cold. Oh, this is a good moment. We're giving you warm. Or like the like most of the time it's like really underlit. But when she goes into the alien spaceship and it's like so bright and so overexposed and like they're just in full control of every part of light and darkness mm -hmm. that they don't need like, the full gamut of color because like you said, it kind of the more boring look is grounding you in this reality. And so yeah. like when you're in these total like mind bending moments, you feel like you still have some connection to reality and right. it's not just like totally out there. And that's, I think a huge strength of this movie is it is totally mind bending, but mm -hmm. it's not like way out there where you're like, that's crazy. That's just so weird. This idea. And like, I can't, can't imagine anything like this. This like, dives deep into what makes us human so deep and focuses so hard on like the human experience that like you come out the other side on like a i can't believe like that works i can't believe this this idea and like, yeah it's so mind-bending in a way that's so different from any yeah, because other it's movies. so personal because totally the, the theme of the movie uh, is a better of loved and lost it's it's about this character it's not about space it's not about uh getting humans to be a multi-planetary species or something yep. like interstellar right. it's like all this crazy stuff happens in the end humans can tell the future but it doesn't matter because what it's really about is her choice to have kids even though it's gonna have a sad yeah, ending. it's really one of the best examples uh illustrating the principle that sci-fi is not about sci-fi or like the best <laughs> yeah. sci-fi is yes. not about spaceships and yeah. stars and stuff it's about using a speculative situation to flip a mirror back at humanity being like, okay, what if this happened? What would, how would we respond to that? And what would that teach us about so much our own nature? Yeah. Sci-fi gets, gets the, the sci right and the people wrong. And this yeah. gets them both right. It's yeah. awesome. And to your point about kind of the tone and the realism of it, the fact that they approach the spaceship with a scissor lift, yeah, you know, it's just like, it's so realistic. Yeah. I love that transition. The Wait, first in a, time in, instead of what? Like oh, a, I don't know, a like a, a drone that lifts them up or something. Or just like a door coming out of the spaceship that's like, oh, like yeah, a ramp like, that like comes down yeah. to you or something. If it was like an alien 
uh, thing. Like it was part of the ship they were coming yeah, in or whatever. Just, no, it's I, a good, it's a good image. Yeah, they left it like as ambiguous as possible. It's like the, it's just this big rock that yeah. just floats there. Yeah, and it's also one of the great. Uh, well, it's not like a huge moment, but uh, it's a little character moment where when they first go up in the scissor lift and then they have to jump off and transfer because like gravity switches. And Louise is scared, right? Yeah. She's like, no, I don't. Like, she's so excited by this whole prospect, right? She's like, you need me. Like, don't get that other guy. Get me. I yeah. need to talk to these aliens. And then she gets all suited up and she gets on the scissor lift. And at, when it's time to jump off, she's like, uh, and they have to pull her oh, off. Her, yeah. Uh, and there's like is, no Foley yeah. that whole time. Yeah. It's just her breathing, yeah. hyperventilating. Okay. Yeah. We should back up because that whole approach, I remember being in the theater being just ripped and, 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 and being so immersed in this movie. Wait, so were you enhanced this time too? No. Oh, okay, good. Um, but I remember in the theater when they're in the helicopter and that giant wide shot with those cool wispy clouds yeah. and you yeah. see the ship yeah. finally because they've just been concealing the, what the ships looks like and just yeah, giving yeah. a little like, you can see the bottom third of it here yeah. in the news yeah. cast and everything and you finally see it in all its glory and oh it's just like, God. It's what such a shot. epic. Yeah. It's such a cool design because it's like, it does not look like a spaceship. The grain of rice. It just looks <laughs> grain of like yeah, or like rock. It just looks like rock, no. and uh, everything is like. I, I I love the courage to not make it because because it it looks weird and otherworldly, and it doesn't look like anything humans would build, which I think we were talking about in the friggin' uh, what's what was it? Uh, what's it called? The crazy horror movie in space? Oh. Uh... With the, oh, 2001. No, 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 no. The no, horror. The, the, uh, Event Horizon. Event Horizon. Event oh, Horizon. That one. Yeah, it yeah. really bothered me because... It's like a church. Yeah, space. because they had spaceships that did not look like things that humans would make. And similarly, this thing actually looks like something aliens would maybe make because it's just yeah. so incomprehensible how yeah. this is a spaceship to yeah. us. And uh, yeah, I just love the design. I, I love how like there's rounded corners on the yeah. squares. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that too in the doorway that, <laughs> yeah, it's in like, the, the it's window. Like, it gave me like iOS vibes. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate the restraints to not show the ships arriving because mm. then when they leave and like they just kind of like yeah. go into a different dimension it's, it's a great so reveal. cool and like I, I, I can I can could have seen a version of this movie where they give you the awe factor at the beginning but I love the slow rollout of the information of just like the news and oh yeah man and they, the first time they interact with them they cut we don't even get to see the aliens when the first yeah. time she's oh, yeah. in there they yeah. cut we just see them like oh that was crazy hey yeah. you're like what the hell? Yeah. I don't, man, for some reason that's like blowing my mind. I thought they have a whole little thing in there where they're like trying to yeah. figure this stuff yeah. out. Speaking of mind blowing, I love how long it takes when they're, when their trucks are like rocking up. Yeah. You really get to sit there and the movie takes this time and you get to sit there and think for yourself, like, what would it be like to be well, driving up to those ships and get to do your job even, on this ship? Even like the, the, the camera work where it's a mix of like really slick, like, like polished camera moves, but then there's a lot of handheld and when the, when it's just like someone walking through a field and it's handheld and the thing's just in the background, it feels so real all of a sudden. Like mm. if it was like a bit like the the that big beautiful shot you were talking where the helicopter's flying over, like that's a gorgeous, awe inspiring shot. But it's like, oh, that's like a CG thing. It's yeah. like it's like a big beautiful movie moment. But when it's just her walking through a field, kind of like having trouble breathing, and it's just like kind of coming in and out of the frame in the background, yeah, it yeah. feels so real to me. Yeah, you're and just I'm, like there's a ship hovering there. I also love in this movie how Denis does his uh, uh, trademark super long shots that are super slow with like, you know, not much happening on the musical front. Uh, but I love it in this movie, whereas in Blade Runner and uh, I think... I forget. Prisoners we did? Prisoners maybe. There's some other movies that we've covered of him that that I'm, I'm like annoyed by super long mm. shots where nothing is happening. But in this one, it's like it works because there's like a gravity to this. There's a world shaking crisis that must be solved and like super interesting time transcending squid aliens. Yeah. And it's like just the fact that we know pretty quickly in the movie that that's what's going on. Well, I don't even well, I, you can we don't, tolerate we, we don't know exactly what's yeah. going in, on. In this particular sequence, they're not long shots. It's a long sequence, but there's actually a lot of cuts. Well, I'm between... not even talking about this sequence. I oh, just okay. mean in the in the movie in general, there's a lot there's there's quite a few of these like signature long shots of Denis Villeneuve. I think it's just it's the pacing is is incredibly tight in the sense that yeah, it, it it's usually fast. comes after it usually comes after like a really big either like whoa moment or like a really interesting I idea about linguistics where like when it's like they're like, we want to get to that question. We want to get to like, what is your purpose here? And she gives like the big speech, like we, this is how we're going to get here. Yeah. Breaks it down. And then it gives you a little breather to be like, whoa, 
that was i guess yeah it's like you have to learn the basics you have yeah. to like do it step by step i gotta say it it does bug me that the military guy uh colonel weber played by forrest whitaker was like as dumb as he is or I, i'm sure he's not like dumb in, t- in terms of like a you know a tactical military sense or whatever but like when he's trying to talk to her and it's like why can't we just punch it yeah <laughs> yeah and he's like wait you want to learn how to speak and read that's got to take longer and we're like he he comes to her with the, the it's so annoying when he comes to her with the recording of the alien speech and he's yep. like what do you make of this and like, can you trans? I need you to translate something for me. And he like plays the thing, yeah. and it's like, sir, that is a fan these, these blowing are, into a microphone. These are extraterrestrial aliens. How am I supposed? I don't but know he, anything. I think, of, I think he's mean? just trying to. It's translate. Not a, it's not a real test. He's like trying to like get a feel for them, and like it's not just like he he. They're gonna try like every single expert that exists. He has no time. Like maybe someone has some insight, something. Yeah. Uh, but I I I love how that scene pays off. Where he like she's like he's like this is your one chance. Like. If you don't answer right now, like I'm gone. This is yeah, it. Yeah. Um, and, and then she's like, she's like, ask him what he says, like war is or whatever. The Sanskrit, the Sanskrit translation for war. Yeah. And then I love the answer to that. Yeah. I think it's such a brilliant answer. It's like he thinks it's like it's argument, and it's like like the other the translation is like I want. Uh, what is or that? The the to an attempt to get more goats or something. Yeah, and it's like okay, it's a conflict focused language versus like problem solving. Yeah. And I'm like, what a good hint at like how we have to kind of take a step back and re-examine our relationship to language. Yeah. And it comes, that that idea comes back later in the movie and it's so fucking fascinating. Mm-hmm. But maybe she's just lying because later on it's revealed <laughs> that she just lies. She could. Yeah, that's true. I don't think so. I think that one is like but a like, real. I've, I feel like what that scene doesn't really answer or that scene and then it's payoff uh, is why he said no to the Berkeley guy. Because he's like, what's the Sanskrit translation for war? Or what's the word for war? And the guy presumably gave him an answer. But well, I he guess, said he's that argument. It was it, yeah, yeah. But there, that's the that's the. the but Colonel that, Weber, Weber didn't know the answer. No, but he he found out. He was able to do more research. It's like an unprompted test. That's what the guy no, said. No, because he asks her at the end. He's like, so what? What was it? What's the real translation? Yeah. She says the need for more goats or something. Well, I think though, I think he has an understanding that what that guy's understanding of that language is like plot hole. I don't think so. I, I don't d- think so. Down to an eight. Wait, but <laughs> when she arrives at the uh, camp. She is someone's successor. Yes. Right. So. Yeah, so oh, oh. So not that's only true. not only was there a guy that just got fired. He also they also said no to this other university guy that they were trying to. Cr- right. Because she maybe. says to the doctor like, oh, like not everybody can handle this the same way or something like that. Yeah. But even uh, even along that same vein, when you find out that the Chinese government is using mahjong to communicate. Yeah. That's I a was good like, moment. that's so fascinating. Like, and it, I love how she she breaks it down. She's like, oh, don't, don't you understand how bad this is? He's like, I don't get it. It's like, oh, it's all conflict based. It's all like, yeah. like there's a winner, there's a loser. It's all about like fighting. And yeah. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, it's so it's just so interesting. And I don't care about right. language that much, but it's such a and it's a good foreshadowing to how like we, we've all heard that idea of like you dream in the language that you're learning and that affects like the way you think. And like mm-hmm. there's a the theory that like your brain is totally shaped by the language yeah, that you're learning. The Sapir Whorf hypothesis. Yeah, I knew about that from from uh, anthropology class. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I'd oh. Heard, and I'd heard that. But the movie does a good job kind of uh, of of. Like, I guess introducing that to people that might not know that. We should say though that it's a theory. It's not. It, yeah. It's a not law. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like evolution. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, like gravity. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, well, there's uh, th- just that there's dispute in among linguists uh, as to whether uh, the language you speak actually does determine how you think or whether it's yeah. the other way. But around. It, it doesn't matter because it's part of the movie. And they, then, in, they introduce that you accept yeah. it as part of the movie. Yeah, yeah. And the yeah. I just think that for me, it. like I think the biggest wall moment is when she's. Like you think she's having a conversation with Jeremy, and she might have had that conversation, but he he gives that he's like gives the the explanation of the theory. He's like, so when did you start dreaming in their language? And then it's like it has like the crazy shit happen. Yeah, and you're, like, you're like, oh oh oh, okay, yeah yeah, this movie just changed. Holy so, shit! So that's actually one of the coolest moments in the movie because it originally it's not in the script. Oh, that was in the edit. Hey, what movie are we talking about exactly? Or which moment? When uh, she's having like, a, it's like, it seems like it's a dream sequence, but I think in retrospect, it's just like the pinnacle of her mind shifting. Well, I think it is a dream sequence. It might be. Yeah. Maybe not. But they're having a conversation and he, he kind of lays out what that theory Ian, is. Ian, Ian does, lays yeah. out what the theory is. And at the end of it, he looks at her and he's just like, so when did you start dreaming in their language? And it's like a moment when you- or, th- He says, are you dreaming in their are language? Are you dreaming yeah. their language yet or whatever? And it's the moment where the audience gets that. And she also gets that like, oh, it's now the, the movie is like going to be kind of like, presented out of time yeah because she's now dreaming in that language yeah i was yeah. like oh that's so cool so originally originally i just found out this out like today that uh originally she there was a there was gonna be a scene where she is like 
they think that she's emotionally compromised and that she can't handle it. So they're about to like take her off the project. And so those scenes with Ian um, were like them talking about, he's like, are you dreaming in their language? Like, are you okay? Like mentally, are you able to take this? Hmm. And um, there's also part of that scene where she's talking to Colonel Weber and trying to convince her, him not to take her off the project. So when, so in the movie, we get this Ian asking her, are you dreaming in their language? And then it cuts back to her, and this is this next shot is a is a uh, it was originally her talking to Colonel Weber, where she was like, uh, "I she, I forget what she says, but the last part she says is that I don't think that makes me unqualified to do this job." And she looks off camera, and it cuts to a shot of the crazy alien. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's originally a shot of Colonel Weber. Oh, and so. In the edit, they were like, okay, we need to cut this scene for time or, or it just isn't working, yeah. but we need to have this uh, knowledge dump that she's dreaming in their language. And, the, and because as you say, it's a, it's a crucial point of the plot and like giving the information, the, uh, giving the audience the information that it's changing her brain. Yep. But like, I, it's a, one of the greatest parts of the movie because <sighs> it just cuts and it's, because there's not a ton of these like jump cuts. There's not a ton of like- Have you seen Enemy? It. Uh, no. Den- it's a, Wait, have I? An earlier Denis Villeneuve movie with uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. Are you just thinking of the ending ending? Spoilers. Wait, spoiler we did alert. this on the podcast. No, we, no, we haven't done it. Uh, Never mind. Spoiler alert for Enemy. Like, actually, this is like the last shot of the movie, so strong spoiler. And it recontextualizes everything. But there's that movie. shot where uh, he's like talking to somebody, like a person, and then it cuts back, like a shot, reverse shot, and when it cuts back, the person is no longer a person, but just a giant spider. Oh. <laughs> and it's like... Yeah. The, it's really similar. Yeah. Like I could see Denny being like, "Ah, we'll do that again." <laughs> <laughs> I think it's more effective in this one. Oh, where, for like, sure. I just think there's so much like intellectual weight behind the changes, and like you just get—I don't know—you just get so wrapped up in the flash forwards and flashbacks, and like it all works like intellectually, but it also really works emotionally. Like yeah. when she's having those flashes and she's crying and she sees her daughter like dead, like I feel the emotion of it, and then like it'll jump to a positive moment where it's where it's where it's her and her daughter having a happy time, or her and yeah. And, and Jeremy Brenner in a happy time. And like it this movie does such an incredible job just like doling out the feelings with the ideas. And like mm. I, I never feel like there's a moment to like fully exhale. You're like constantly like taken in a new place and like constantly on the journey. And it's fucking incredible. I feel yeah. like the uh, when you think they're flashbacks on your first watch, yeah. they really have a lot of emotional weight. And then I'm on I'm just thinking of the logic on it on uh, repeat viewings. Mm. But it actually they make so much more sense as premonitions. Yes. Yeah. Because I kind of just took it for granted, you know, okay, she's had this trauma in her life, like on my first viewing. These are f- flashbacks. She's had this trauma. I guess now she's in, I guess she's working hard. She's in a stressful situation. So like the the, the weight of this trauma is just like at the forefront. Yeah. And she can't do the job because she keeps thinking of her daughter. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But it doesn't like fully makes sense yeah, yeah. well so it's like it, it makes more it makes more sense that they're premonitions yeah it almost feels cheap i feel like the first time where you're like oh they're just giving us these things to like give us some kind of emotion amongst all these right. intellectual ideas but you're right on once you kind of understand the logic and the timing of it it it's way more tightly integrated and it's kind of yeah. more interesting and the other thing is you're like she t- she takes off her her hazmat suit in oh. the ship and you're like yeah that's fine <laughs> and it turned out she has her first premonition right after that. Oh. That's why. <laughs> that's why it happened. Yeah, yeah. She, she yeah. has. Yeah, she like kneels down and like is catching her breath and yeah. stuff. Yeah, like because yeah, later on in the movie, when she takes the uh, capsule into their ship, she's inhaling that smoke, and that's when she like really, really gets yeah. it. So I, I, I guess it's implied that she starts to get it after just inhaling a bit. Yeah. But then we never have a scene from Ian, who also takes his suit off. Yeah. We, I don't believe there's any, unless I missed it, I don't think I don't there's think any little too. scene where he's like, oh, I had a weird dream. But it's not his perspective. Do you think it'd be better? No, I think it would just like, it could be confusing and I think it's better to focus on her experience and it then could be the confusing. movie's kind of more tightly integrated on her loop. Whereas yeah. if you kind of step outside of her loop and her experience, then it's just not as pi- like tightly well, packed. Plus, but also, she's, she's, she's only, better at language, so. Yeah. Well, but she's the only one with the loop, right? She's oh, the true. only one out of these characters who actually learns to perceive time in this way. Yeah, but Ian, um, what I'm saying is Ian would. All humans eventually will. She teach when she, the, yeah. she teaches this language to them. But but what's interesting is that I, I, guess, I guess I think it's implied that it takes her a while to kind of interpret everything and like write the book and get it out there and start disseminating the information because no one else actually learned. Maybe maybe some people from the other countries did, but she is the first one to kind of like condense it into a, something Become and like fluent. start. start yeah. yeah. So like because this is key because. Ian doesn't, she doesn't reveal to Ian that she knows their daughter is going to die until their daughter is some years old. 
right? And that's yeah. why Ian leaves at oh, some point. Oh, I guess point. you're right. Because there, she doesn't, she doesn't, A, she doesn't fully learn how to like explain it and like people don't really get it that she is uh, you know, omniscient in terms yeah, of her own life. Um, and so <laughs> they get together. He's like, you want to make a baby? And she's like, yes. He doesn't know still at that point. So they have the baby. The kid grows up. I'm, I'm guessing she's around like six or seven or something when she tells him, I knew about oh, yeah. this. Um, because we see him around and like them yeah, reading it's kind of weird her. though because I can understand how it's like hey this is a, a crazy language it's going to take years for people to, to learn this she had the benefit of having this white smoke steroids like helping yeah, her learn yeah, yeah. but he <laughs> he took his ma- his suit off in there as well wait no I don't, I don't smoke didn't do anything what I think I think smoke didn't give her the language. Yeah, it did. No, it didn't. Yes, it does. She already knew most of it already. No, 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 dude. Because when by the time she goes into the capsule up into the ship, she's been having premonitions. Mm -hmm. So, which indicates that taking the hazmat suit off while during previous sessions helps her. No. To me, I thought it does. I thought the big moment when it transfers is when they put their hands on the glass, and I thought that that's a big moment of connection. And like she, he. He gives her the ink and then she controls the ink. I thought that yes. was the moment where she's like, I'm fluent. And I think you're not wrong where like that experience also fully connects her with the language. It's like you can learn French when you're in Vancouver, but then you go to Paris and you're like, all right, yeah, I'm learning right, French. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, well, let me pause because there's two things here. Um, the, the conjecture that when she takes the hazmat suit off, she's getting some kind of atmosphere in her and that's helping yeah. her learn it. Her no. and Ian both get it. I am willing to concede. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe she's just learning and like, but Ian's there learning okay. every session she's there yeah. he's there yeah. anyways. Anyways. anyways but there's when, no like physical particles that are going into them helping them to learn the language i think there are because when she then <laughs> why when she goes into the pod mm-hmm. it fills with the smoke she breathes it in yeah she's like floating in it she gets into the part of the spaceship where they are and she's way be- that she's way better at the language at she's that point she's just talking to them she's yeah. talking no. to them there's subtitles they she, talk to her and there's subtitles yeah i know but that, it is already shown that they can show her uh characters and she can just read them like he's 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 just he's writing in the air and she is reading the things I like think, she can I read the language fighting over at like that a, point. We're, we're fighting over like a really small well, no part this is but really I, important I, because I, in I, the lore yeah. it's like it's really important whether she gets the language from magical dust entering her body or whether she actually just learned the language at that point and that's why she's able to no, understand i, I, think, well, I le- think it's both yeah i think it's both i think she I learned think the language is. but i think the fact that the movie goes out of its way to make the communication inside of like the their atmosphere so much clearer and so much easier. I think to me communicates like that proximity or something. There is a physical element. So to yeah, that I thought that was rewiring the brain a little faster. So, so here's here's my here's where I think I stand on it. Where I I was because this is like hard sci-fi in a way. Yeah. I I'm I'm hesitant to say that there's like kind of like a mystical element of here. Obviously, you know, perceiving time non-linearly, there's like a little bit of a magical thinking yeah. sort of thing going on there. But you know, that's 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 within the realm of physics. Like the, there are theories that uh, you know postulate that our perspective of time and uh, as linear is not necessarily the only way of thinking about it. But anyways, uh, the way the 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 concession that I will make here maybe is that the the one one thing that I well, question that I have is how they control the ink. Yep. So I'm like, maybe there's like they're dipping into the fourth dimension, time dimension type of thing to like control the ink. Cause, cause like, how do they do that? How are they just like squirting this ink out and they're like, it's like telekinesis. Yeah. So I'm like, okay, is there some sort of like external manipulation of like a dimension thing going on yeah. there? And maybe her learning the language allows her because she learns how to move the ink like that so it's like okay Wait, how are you doing that she, what she does she moves the with um, one hand one she, of yeah that's an interesting scene i wonder what you guys think that means where she is both hands up to try and like make a circle well, well when was that her, she puts her hand on the glass it's and uh Abbott and like puts, this, it's the final scene when they're in the ship and the, the explosion is about yeah. is imminent and like the they slam on the glass because they're trying to like get it through faster. Yeah. And then he puts his hand or like i can't remember how he communicates so, so it. abbott puts his hand or his tentacle thing, his foot one yeah, of his heptopods whatever on the glass and then she puts her hand on the glass and there's ink there and she learns how to manipulate it in that moment and so then uh abbott and louise draw a circle together they both they both draw both sides of the circle and she's like writing in the alien language so she at that point she understands she's writing in the language yeah she understands it um and also it's kind of a beautiful image because their language is made of circles 
which are, you know, there's no beginning and no end. So you, like they, the way they describe this is beautiful. They call it nonlinear orthography because you would have to, like when you're writing a sentence, you would have to be starting from both ends. Like the, the, the way yeah, that it would make sense the lady in English. the tramp thing with the spaghetti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> like if you were writing in English non-linearly, you would have to know your entire sentence and the structure and you'd have to be able to write it from yeah. both ends so that they meet in the middle sort of thing. So that's what they're doing by drawing both halves of the circle. It's also such a beautiful, beautiful. payoff to the idea of like the need for cooperation. Because that's like mm-hmm. an, another thing about this movie that's like, I think uh, totally incredible is that message of hope. Uh, yes. And like in and the need for cooperation and communication in a time where like we could be so divided. Yeah. Uh, and I think like that image of them, like having to do it together, mm-hmm. even though they're completely different species that like before a couple months ago, couldn't communicate. Like there's something so powerful just in that image on top of like the rest of the movie. Like this movie gives me shivers. Just like it's, it's such a, the turn from like, it's seeming like it's like a movie about dread and horror and mm. cod- this like, our pl- like we're so small and like our place in the universe to the opposite it's like yeah no we need you humans we need you to cooperate and be the best you can be right. so that you can help us later because like- we live in a deterministic universe <laughs> where we are going to die in three thousand years yeah, so we know this yeah. also it's either that the aliens are three thousand years old or, or or that they live for thousands of years or that they have like because they can see outside of time they can just like literally see the future beyond their own lifetimes. Right, something. because all we know about Louise is that she can see her own lifetime. Yeah. Mm. Um, but yeah, I believe that, I, I think that's totally beautiful about the hope thing. Like, I, I think it's a it's a it's such an interesting uh, detail that the aliens arrive, they don't show any aggression at all. All of the conflict in the movie comes from humans. Yeah. It's from, they're just hovering there and they'll be like, hey, let's talk, let's figure stuff out. And all of the, the crazy, oh, we're about to everyone's going hysterical it shows yeah. uh news clips of like different countries people riding in the streets people things are burning china's about to blow it out of the sky all of the conflict comes from humans man like the and like the little details in those sequences we're projecting like oh my god it's so real and like even the soldiers how they bomb they bomb the ship because yeah. they think that there was they're listening to fake news of yeah of course that, they had uh, to have honestly, some uh, the, anti-vaxxers on the team the pod the podcast <laughs> like shots fired the, shots fired the, the the shot where it's like the like clip of the podcaster like giving his theory the Alex or whatever. Jones type guy. Oh man, that, that ups, it was upsetting because I'm like, it's too real. That's like, way too it's real. It's so fucking real. Yeah, that it's was so upsetting. That was particularly real. Yeah. yeah. For, because of the pandemic stuff. Oh yeah, for God. sure. People are like angry online. Yeah. <laughs> thinking, thinking that there's yeah. this like whole crazy danger. We have to do something about it. Yeah. We can't just take this lying down. Yeah. Oh, they're, 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 there are forces working against us. These aliens are good. You know, well, but it's like it's f- fair yeah. to th- fair to think, I, but I, that's us projecting because that's what we would. But think. But I, I think it's interesting too because like it's like we even the posturing of the ship I found interesting in terms of communication because I the ships kind of do three different stances. There's like the the neutral vertical stance mm. very close to the ground, and then after the explosion, there's the going up, yep. further away, and then there's the going horizontal. Right. And so there's like the three postures. There's I'd say neutral. There's like uh, withdrawn, and then like aggressive. But it's like, am I bringing that in? Am I bringing in that that idea of aggression when it goes horizontal, or is it something completely different? I'd say you are, and you need to look deep inside. Maybe. Maybe. We have no idea, though. Yeah, we're never told exactly. But all we know is that they go back vertical when the like situation deescalates a bit. Yeah. yeah. Who knows? Um, I really wanted to look up what the name was for getting native populations to fight amongst themselves in Hungary. Oh, did you find it? <laughs> because, oh. because no, I did not. But uh, that's that's b- relevant to what we were just saying, where she's like, like the CIA, CIA guy is like, we have to consider the possibility that they are trying to get us to fight amongst themselves in order to weaken us for invasion or whatever. He doesn't say mm-hmm. all of that, but, but, but yeah. she's like, but there's no evidence of that. And he's like, sure there is. Pick up a history book. <laughs> and it's of, like, of, of Earth- human history, yeah. not of the heptopods, like my her, best friends. Her job throughout the whole movie is to be like, you can't take that stuff for granted. Yeah. But yeah. so so I will say that it's a little idealistic, you know? Yeah. Because it's like the uh, it's a little bit unrealistically optimistic that the globe would just kind of a that aliens would be completely benevol- bele- benevolent yeah. in this way, although it's sort of like it's a, it's a it's symbiotic more like, relationship. Yeah, yeah, it's more like utilitarian in that way, but but uh, a there's that and then b that the globe would be like Oh, I got a phone call, and she, she told me my wife's dying words. Yeah. Cancel everything. Send the ships back home. All yeah. the globe works together. We have a United Nations my, event. Well, it was we like don't know. Li- she could have said a little more than yeah. that. No, no, no. I just, I just mean that, like, 
it's a happy ending, sort of. I mean, yeah. it, um, never mind the daughter dying or whatever, but like in terms of all the nations deciding to work together, it's a little bit of a too much of a happy ending For to sure. be realistic, but. I like it. That's why I wanted my movies. I want hope. I want optimism. I agree. I love the message of hope. I think most of my point for deduction comes from that sequence uh, with the Chinese general. It just feels like it's weird because it is earned. It's not day sexy, but it, it feels kind of, I don't know, the most simple part of the movie where it most neatly falls into time travel mm. movie. Uh, and it's the least interesting and it's kind of the most drawn out and the tension isn't there for me. And I, I just yeah. don't like that sequence at I all. I don't like that. It's a paradox. I, I so what I like about that sequence is when they first arrive and he's so like enamored by her and he's like oh thank you so much for what you did like that part I felt that that works for me with the message of hope and like like the better human humanity where it's like this Chinese general and this American scientist like having such uh or like ha him having such respect for her yeah but then when it, it as it as it plays out and he's like I need to yeah the paradox of it as well, that kind of plays out I don't know it just it's not a paradox it is a paradox no Okay. It's not. <laughs> Let me explain why I think it is, and you can explain your counter argument. In another time travel movie, it would be a paradox. I'll give you that. I think it's a paradox because he's saying, you have already called me. Yes. Here's my phone number for you to do that in the past. Yep. And but, but it's not a paradox because... It's not a paradox because in this movie, it's, it's established that time is deterministic. Mm. Because, so, time is a flat circle, bro. But she's still There's living no, it in one line. I mean, yeah, yeah. It she, literally no, is a flat but circle. at any time, her awareness, like her conscious awareness at the forefront, might be in any one of these times. But she is existing simultaneously at all times. So maybe at that point, she's like, "I called you, didn't I?" But she can still forget stuff, just like we forget stuff, right? But then she kind of is like, "Oh, wait, am but, I?" But let, how let did me look she in my dial memory. the number in the past when she did not have the number? She did have the number. She just didn't know she had the number. So you had to remember the number. If you you can forget a number and then be like, what was it? What was it? Mm, and then you see something that triggers you. You're like, oh yeah, that. I know what it is. I and that's know, what's man. happening. Except, and this is why I think it's so beautiful that uh, at various points, people talking about this movie have described her as having memories of the future. Because it's not that she's having premonitions and suddenly she she's like she went remembering. From, <laughs> yeah, not remembering. remembering. Yeah, exactly. Sure. But like. At a certain point in her life is when she gains this awareness, right? So, like, before that point in her life, she doesn't know about uh, the flat circle of time, uh, whatever. And but she has to get to that point, and then after that point, her awareness is like, ah, I know all, I know everything in my life. So it's like you, I, I grant you that in another, like in the Avengers time travel universe, this would be a paradox because there's, uh, you can change the past, you can create new parallel universes based on changes that happen like in a multiverse situation it would be sort of a paradox in other traditional time travel thing like in back to the future where there aren't like different branches per se but you can change yep. the timeline in this one you can't change the timeline everything is as it is it's a flat circle everything on the circle has already happened when you write the character it's all there already you don't get from one point to the next mm. it's all there instantly so it's it's not a paradox per se but she is able to call him in the past because in the future she calls she gets the number i just got there mentally myself because i was thinking okay here's what i would accept i would accept if she was like okay i really want to call this guy i know that i meet him in the future but and, that's not I, how, have, and yeah. I have his number in the future so then if there's a scene where she's like talking to him gets the number then presumably she could go and then make that call however if she has the ability to do that then she could have already done that in, as part of her life and so it all does make sense. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't care if you think, follow my logic. No, no, the point think, is that I got there. I think, yeah, yeah, you, I think you did. I think the problem is that when we think about time travel, we're thinking about, okay, you're in this time and then you travel to this time and then you're there and then you, from from when, like from there, you travel to this other time. But there's no traveling. She's yeah. existing. Yeah. Her awareness yeah. is at all times, yeah. all the time. And I think the movie is definitely trying to convey that where like the human experience is that circle. I think like that's part of the point of that language. Being a circle is yeah. that like, that's what time is, is we are caught in that and that our lives, like the big moments in our lives, like where her daughter dies or where she meets the Chinese general are part of that like flourish in the circle. Yeah. And I think that like, there's like a beautiful artistry to those, like to the language, but I also think it's like a beautiful flourish in terms of how we experience our lives. And there's like, it is a circle, but there's like, there's these moments of yeah like, that create a, a, an emotional gravity that we always like are drawn towards so if like we're living in this circle like we spend more time because like the gravity of those emotions is mm. stronger right. and we're caught in in, in in life but like yeah we breathe and we exhale in those moments of flourish and it's so 
fucking incredible. Damn, yeah, dude, you're this beautiful. Is poetry. This movie, is, this <laughs> movie blows my mind. I, this I is a good like... time to get into nitpicks. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> uh, one of the well, okay, I guess you could qualify as this as a hit pick when um, uh, she has like a premonition, and then we. This is one of the moments that really illustrates that they are future moments and not past moments, where she has a vision of the future where she's standing there at the lake, and uh, Hannah which is great because her name is Hannah. It's a palindrome. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah we saw the movie, Riley. Yeah, I know. I just, uh, they don't actually say that. She's like, yeah, why is do. my name Hannah? Did she say palindrome? Yeah. Okay, never mind. Uh, anyways, her daughter is like, mom, mom, mom. And she like goes from the present moment to the future moment. And she's like, what? And she asks Hannah, what day is it? So in that moment, she's like, oh, some yeah, of her yeah, awareness yeah. is yep. still in the past. But then uh, she gives immediately like a, time contextual answer of like why did dad daddy want to leave or whatever and yeah. then she like oh because this or whatever and she her awareness can just like shift completely to yeah. that time i thought that was beautiful because yeah. i feel like it also really illustrates to you how her awareness works it's not like she's huh how did i get here yeah. it's like there might be like a half moment where she's like wait which time am i in again and yeah. then she's like i think oh, I know she's everything. also developing it at that yeah, point yeah. too i think a big moment of developing it is when the daughter's like what's that thing called where no one wins but everyone wins yeah. the zero and then she goes back yeah game. she goes back to the present and then there's a thing that flashes it and then she comes back and she's like oh it's yeah Not yeah that, that yeah. actually uh, it was one of my nitpicks i thought that part was just too i don't know too neat what non-zero sum game yeah mom that's exactly what i was thinking of <laughs> ah, what do you mean i don't know i man. just feel like that's too wordy it clicked it clicked this is the daughter of scientists and a linguist okay zero sum game would have been fine non dash zero sum game it's just too much it, mm, i don't fair, like it fair fair it, it's okay i say zero sum game all the time it's on one of my james starter pack items it's one of my i love it <laughs> that'd be a good, pretty good map. that's a good, good board game title um must be it's a there's play. an earlier moment to the one you're thinking of where we do not yet know that they're premonitions. Actually, mm. it's in the opening montage where she's hanging out with her kid. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, while she's a child, uh, because she ends up it's as a teen that she gets the disease, but yeah. there's a child shot when they're playing and she's the kid's dressed up as like a horse cowboy mm -hmm. thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, also, where Louise kind of like looks really ruefully off. Like she she looks sorrowful, like she knows what's going to happen. Mm. But we don't, we don't know, know that, that she knows. Like yeah. it's only... You, you watch this on your repeat viewings and you're like, ah. Oh, this is what I didn't get to say is that on my third watch around, I'm okay, on the second watch around even, like watching this movie, knowing what's going to happen is almost like having that sort of like nonlinear knowledge of. Well, this is what we were talking about earlier yeah. where yeah. it's meta. It's so meta. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. Welcome it's to the conversation, yeah. Riley. It's oh, fucking incredible. Geez, I, my hit, one of my big hit picks is the, the design of the aliens feel really fucking alien. It's awesome. It's so cool. And like, I love how you only get a small picture of them through the glass, just like you only get a small picture of like these people's lives through the glass of the uh, movie that you're looking at. Yeah. But then when you're inside and you see how much bigger they are and you get like the full image and you still don't get the full image of them because they're still obscured by like the smoke and you're like, yeah. what are they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think they're phenomenal. I think That's it's kind of, cool. it ends up being kind of funny how they literally are just like squids. Like, yeah. they, like, but I love how there's a little head on top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it seems kind of goofy but then there is also just like a gravity to it where you're just like wait is that their head what's their head yeah. and it just like reminds you that there's they're completely unknown they still don't need to have a head well i mean maybe they don't have a head but like there's a something that the camera cuts the to when they're like Burr. yeah the sci-fi nerd in me is like where's the brain like yeah. is it up there or is it down here or is it like, like an octopus where like the brain isn't in the tentacles Where's the piss? Is it in is the balls? It? They don't the, have a central brain? They, I think they have a central brain, but the arms are also part of it. Right, right. I think I might be a little bit off. They're like but. server blades. Yeah. Well, your <laughs> yeah. brain yeah. your brain and your nervous system are all one. It's just there's more nervous system in That's that part fair. of your body. That's fair. True, dude. Damn. There's a weird uh, foreshadowing part in this movie where they're about to get their medical exams and the doctor is like, are you pregnant? And she goes, no. And then she looks at Ian. Oh. Mm. Wait. Oh, it's just a weird. I don't know. Weird. But she doesn't know at that point, but maybe there's a little bit. But it's it's not like a hardcore foreshadowing because, from the audience perspective, um, we know that she, we think that she had a child in the past, so it's a sensitive question. From a normal social dynamics perspective, it's like if there's a woman and a man in a room, and and the woman's asked if she's pregnant, she might just glance at the man. She might just glance at any <laughs> one other person in the room. You're probably yeah, gonna glance yeah. at them anyway. Just, I'm not pregnant yet, but I could be. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, because we know <laughs> on repeat viewings that that is the father of her child, it is kind of a foreshadowing thing. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
So Abbott knew he would die. When he saved them? Yeah. When they came. When he knew it all yeah, time. Right so they knew time. that they knew there was a bomb in the ship. Greater good. But and so like I think that scene is really great because Abbott is a little late. Mm. So like they should uh, Ian and Ian and uh, Louise are like, okay, we got to go in there, and the soldiers like, no way, we, uh, oh, just okay, let just let them go, and they get in there. Costello is in there, the short squat one. Yep. Also, I love how they're Abbott Costello, and Costello is the short squat. I actually, squat never one even knew that they looked different. A, yeah, I didn't either until this time. I was huh. like, he, when he says Abbott and Costello, I looked at them. I'm like, yep. oh, one kind of has longer, spindlier legs, and the other <laughs> one is kind of more short and squat. That's, That's perfect. Anyways, uh, Costello is there, and Abbott is not, and they're like, where's Abbott? Oh, blah, blah, blah. and then. Abbott shows up and it's almost like who's so, on a zoom call well no he I think, saying goodbye I think it's like well who knows what he was doing but I feel like the fact that we know that he knew he was gonna die is like maybe he was like taking a moment and being like okay initiate death I can process. do this yeah. yeah and I love how they say it's death process because it's like Ugh. how do their awarenesses work do yeah. they like death process is he still kind of like could, would he be able to see this moment when he's like dead or like you know how does that know. work I so know. yeah I it, it, it really leaves it open for yeah. like to say death process yeah. that was that was another scene where my like the emotion of it really overtook me like when like you see the countdown of the bomb and you're like okay uh oh the bomb's gonna go off and when they like throw them out of the room and then lock it yeah and, uh, that like I like almost broke down like it's I don't mm. know what it is about like the whole sequence of it but it felt it was just one of those like like we have to work together moments where I'm yeah. like, these aliens will sacrifice themselves for us. Like we can fucking do this. Yeah. Well, ultimately I, for them. Yeah. They're coming for selfish reasons. Yeah. Well, but like, but, uh, yeah. The help me help you situation. It is a help me help you situation, but at the same time, it's like, these people are or also, actually, no, it's a help you help me situation. But also like these yeah. people maybe won't benefit from it. Maybe they just have an awareness of it. So like, I, I, I don't want to like discredit what those specific aliens are doing. Like that, like Costello, is it Costello that died? Because Abbott died. Abbott died, and maybe he sacrificed himself, like for the greater of their race. Like we don't know how many yeah. of them there are. We don't know how there is, and like we don't know if this is a mission of like, like we don't know what that mission that these people are on. Like if they're like the bravest of their species that have come. Yeah. And, like, like we know they can kind of teleport. We don't know if they're teleporting into the other spaceships. So there's like 24 of them all in yeah. one spaceship. There's God knows there's room in those giant spaceships. Yeah. And maybe they're just all making the little noodle limbs go with each other at and, night and we don't know and maybe there is only one <laughs> ship that like I, I you, like we don't really know maybe there's only one ship that's appearing in all of them and like Abbott and Costello are the only ones mm. that are like communicating with every, all, all of us but like they're they're just beings uh, that can yeah, exist outside. we don't know yeah maybe and they like, can like, time they're, travel they're, so that they they're playing Mejong and talking to Louise at the same yeah. time <laughs> oh man oh, I love speaking of Mejong I love the idea that I, I mean we already kind of touched on it but I love the uh, implication that uh, a competitive Mindset is like unproductive as a framing device in yeah. many situations. Totally. Which I feel like is why I'm a deeply uncompetitive person because I don't like the idea that in any like human interaction. Yeah, maybe you just you, suck. That's true. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have to I have to acknowledge that possibility, but I don't like the idea that in any human situation you you're you're thinking about a way to defeat the other person instead no. of cooperate or getting the most out of it. Yeah, as you can. the line like when when I give you a hammer, everything's a nail. I love that line. It's I I don't know. I just the perfect love... punctuation to that scene. Yeah, oh, uh, brilliant. Yeah, my nitpick. Uh, I feel like I really love the linguistic uh, teachings of this movie, mm. but I feel like there's a little bit of a jump from like them having like a couple words where it's like Louise. Uh, to like them having the iPad that like can read the circle and like get the like full sentence. Yeah, I get it. It's like it's not super important for us to fully understand the process of uh, getting the alien language. But I I felt that way, and the people I watched it were like, "Wait, what happened?" Where mm -hmm. it's just like there's like a little bit. I think the jump's just like a little bit too far. Like we needed like something. Yeah, in all we, we do get the Ian walking. Yeah, which yeah. is a cool idea, but we don't get a lot of oh, we're learning their language. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like. To, unless they wanted to completely create a new language, I feel like they necessarily because they didn't create the whole septopod language or whatever, right? I I feel like that it's kind of a necessary thing for the movie. I sure. I've I thought that it I didn't th think it felt weird. Like uh, they do a montage, and also in terms of like changes to the script and stuff, a lot of the stuff that we learn in the montage was originally like uh, actual scenes with the characters, like talking about that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, I thought it, I thought it felt fine. 
Uh, they were like, well, you know, we learned this and we learned this. It's like, what do you, yeah, and it what, was over the course of a month. Yeah, yeah. So I kind of forgave sure, it. Sure. What know? do you guys think of that montage? It felt kind of like a documentary to me where they're kind of explaining what they're doing. And it it's felt like a little jarring. Yeah. Oh, I, that's I, when Ian is talking. Yeah, he's giving like a narration. And, and like, I like it, but it, it com- almost felt like it was just like, yeah, a documentary movie. And yeah. It was interesting. And like all the teachings of it are really interesting. Knowing, but. knowing that it was a kind of a thing they did in the editing to, mm. to, find a way to keep the information from these scenes uh I w- uh, i'm kind of like okay yeah that makes sense and without that knowledge it does feel a little jarring like who is ian talking to right now is this a documentary they made after the fact or like that's that's kind of what i thought but yeah. they don't really say that and yeah. what do you what do you guys think of the emotional ending of uh ian and louise where he does leave her i thought like because this movie goes from like cosmic dread to hopefulness i was hoping that like their emotional journey would kind of end with hopefulness too. Like I, I kind of wish that he like in, in the final flash forward of the daughter dead when like, it's like that shot of like her like bald and Amy Adams pulling back crying that the camera pulled it back a little bit. And like Jeremy Renner was there too crying. And like, we don't need much more explanation like as to like how their relationship was, but that he didn't give up on his daughter that he didn't like actually fully leave. Mm-hmm. I think that would be a, that would tie in more tightly to the message of hopefulness. Yeah, I, but I don't know if that's what the not. movie's trying to do, though. Maybe David likes hopefulness, but maybe to me, it's more about bittersweetness. Mm. Mm. Yep. Because I really like when they are finally connecting at the end, and he's professing his love to her, and she looks at him, and instead of them kissing, which would have been in ninety nine out of a hundred movies, they hug. She just <laughs> hugs him sorrowfully, and the th- motif, the theme yeah. that plays, the music is so awesome for that yeah. too. Yeah. So it's like it's just this knowing hug where she's like, from his perspective, he's like, I think this is pretty cool. Would have liked to kiss. <laughs> kiss would have been all right, but this is cool too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But from her perspective, it's just like she's accepting it. Acceptance. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And that's kind of what I was like getting at in the beginning, where mm. to me there is that hopeful resolution with the nations of the wor- of the earth working together yeah. and stuff, and that's very hopeful. But on a personal level, her arc is going from. Um, I mean, like, it, I feel like it would be stronger if she was like, if if we saw that fear even more, like, beca- because her, I feel like the end point of her arc is accepting life and accepting this suffering, this this in a, this uh, unavoidable fate of mm. like, you're going to have a child and there's going to be joy there, but then the child is going to die and that's going to be hard and you're going to find love with Ian, but you're going to separate and that's going to be hard. So I think that her coming to this place where she knows that life is going to have this pain and the suffering, but also moments of tenderness and joy. And she accepts all of it. She she says, I'm going to take all of that because that's existence. And I accept it because it's like, it takes courage to look at life with all of its suffering and its pain and say, that's worth it. There's meaning there. There's value there. Even if it's not good, I guess it's a very stoic sort of, for uh, sure. I guess I think that, along that same point like jeremy renner's character can come to that conclusion where like even though he's not experiencing it as a circle as as her now that he's gotten a glimpse of like knowing that there is suffering like that he can also come to that answer that like all of this pain all of the suffering is still worth the moments of joy i guess she couldn't ultimately convince him of that maybe not i think that would be too neat maybe like i feel like we have the hopeful ending with the nations and we have to have a little bit of reality there where you know, He's just not things like to... things like this do or, cause risk. I think it, that would come down to what kind of emotion Denis wants to leave you with, because mm. I think m- more people would like it if it was very neat and hopeful sure. and optimistic. But I don't think they would hold the emotion for as long. You would probably just be like, hmm, what do you want to eat now? And, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. you walk into the theater and then just go get some noodles. Whereas with the emotion that he does deliver, that kind of more sorrowful, bittersweet one. It just kind of stays with you for longer, and it's a little bit of a more unique message. Fair, and that's fair. He's a yeah. physicist, you know, didn't he? Yeah. He's just yeah. like you had the data and you didn't act on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like him in this movie. I'm not a huge Renner fan, but I that's like him good. in this movie. Yeah, he's great. I, I and I love the pairing of her being a linguist and him being a physicist, and like he he he, he challenges her in the beginning and says. Uh, you know, the cornerstone of civilization isn't language, it's science. No, well, that. and but that depends on your definition of civilization. Well, yeah. exactly. But I think that that's what's beautiful about it is that they are both, they both, they obviously have different perspectives about the importance of language and science respectively, but they were working together to achieve this end. I think it was beautiful. And then they end up 
doing it. <laughs> Here's a hit pick. We never really finished talking about the sequence where they approach the ship and go in. I think that is oh, yeah. such a sweet sequence. So and I, I love how when they the scissor lifts gets up to it, there's that shot of the hand. I think it's Ian's hand like touching the ship. It's just... Just nerding out, being like, oh, I get to talk to the aliens. Oh, I get to go to the ship. I mm. want to touch the ship. I yeah, wanna... yeah, he's so nerdy. Yeah, but yeah. one of the coolest parts is before the whole gravity shift thing, they kind of, there's this awesome moment of visual storytelling that primes you for what's about to happen so you can understand it better, which is someone has a smartphone on their forearm yeah. and it's the orientation starts to flip between landscape and portrait. Oh. And that's just like... I wrote that down too. It's just beautiful the yeah. great the little yeah that environmental so storytelling that's type really of thing. cool i didn't yeah. notice that and then they they crack a glow stick and throw it up so we can see that yeah. the gravity is going to change um and then ian is the last guy to leave the the scissor lift and everyone else is kind of like doing it and they're like being careful like all right this is a mission and he's like all right i can do this and he just kind of like Throws takes himself. a jump he just goes for it and kind of like bails a little bit but he's like okay all right, it's like he's so excited to be there. He's just like changing gravity, cool. So cool. <laughs> Another hit pick I have is how when she ultimately goes inside the ship on the same side of the glass as mm. uh, Costello, that's the shot we get. Is the background is the glass, where, and where the glass that she was standing on the other side of mm. previously. It's not like she's in some random part of the ship. Yeah, we're in the same part, and it's that's just another really good uh, visual of the theme. You know, like of communication. There's no barriers now. Do you think that they manipulate gravity? Uh, so that gravity is less in there, and that's why her th one of my rare nitpicks for this movie is her zero g hair effects don't yeah, look, don't look amazing. There's a lot of CG. Well. Yeah, there's a lot of CG. Yeah. That's just like okay. But do you think it's like gravity manipulation in there, or is there something about that gas that kind of like lets them float around? I think it's a bit of both. Like it could mm. be either. Definitely, the gas has some. Obviously, kind of they effect. can manipulate gravity. Yeah. So I, I assumed it was a bit of both. Also, so irritating to me when. <laughs> In sci-fi movies where there are aliens that are like incomprehensible, people like the humans, the military people are like, "We're gonna show them, we're gonna show a force. We're gonna show them who's who. We're gonna oh my God. shoot our guns at them." I'm like, "They, they can travel through dimensions. Yeah, what the fuck? They're hovering. Even you know, those soldiers. That like, stuff is so frustrating yeah. that it makes you actually mad. And it's like, like, what do you yeah. think you're gonna?" Who yeah. do you think is going to win in an armed conflict? No one would think that. Yeah, you're fucking tanks. <laughs> uh, we're declaring, we, you have 24 hours to leave. <laughs> also, that confusion that leads to that uh, is a whole thing in this movie because they say, off, okay, we're here to offer a weapon. What's the line that Ian reads out of Louise's book while they're on the helicopter? Language is the glue that holds a civilization together. It's the first weapon drawn in a conflict. Did the heptapods know that Louise thought of language as a, one of the things she thought of as was a weapon? Oh, shit. That's a question. But also the fact that Ab they named them Abbott and Costello. It's another beautiful reference because Abbott and Costello's most favorite, famous skit is this who's on first skit where it's all about language and misinterpretation, confusion. There's oh. so many layers to this thing. Oh. It's crazy. I love it. It's so good. Here's the contrived part I don't like. Um, I understand why they did it for the movie, but it's when they're about to go on the ship and then they ask that military guy, so like, what do they look like? Oh, and he yeah. just says, you'll see soon enough. Yeah, fuck you, Instead dude, of just me. being like, uh, kind of like a squid. Yeah, yeah, it's like a giant, it's a giant black squid. <laughs> they're like a squid, but instead of like squishy tentacles, they have bones, so like they have knuckles and stuff. Like yeah. a big hand, basically. <laughs> yeah. Like you could say it in a sentence. Yeah. It's not like yeah. there's some kind of really abstract. I agree. They, but, they appear as whatever you is convenient for your mind to make sense of. But them, at the right? same time, he's like a stoic military guy, and he's just like, shut up, put on your suit. <laughs> at the same time, he's just a device in a movie to yeah. amplify the suspense. Totally. Yeah. So Forrest, I get it, but it's just kind of meh. Man, Forrest Whitaker really. Uh, that eye. It's just like, how <laughs> so it looks emotion. moist, you know? So much emotion just to that one eye. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, think that, the, I think we didn't really talk about the performances, but I think they're pretty no. flawless. Like, they never yeah. take they never take you out of it. You're just like, yep, these are the people doing the thing. Yeah, and yeah. the pacing is so good. In the so first half hour of it, it moves fast. You know what's funny? I mean, like, maybe this is rude to the actors, but I feel like every other element of this movie is so perfectly executed that I feel like the performance almost don't, doesn't even matter. Like, Amy, I, I don't like Amy Adams. As an actress. Really? I barely... I, I, she's good. Man. I hardly, Have you seen The Master? No. Ah, she's good in that. She's okay. a good actor. Well, maybe I'll check out The Master, but I'm, I've been, it's definitely on my list. I just it's on our list. Around to it. Oh, we should do it. Yeah, we will. Um, But yeah, I don't I don't know. I don't love her. I, I feel like her... I always see Amy Ab Adams, the actress, uh, on screen. I don't right. know. But 
and uh, uh, Jeremy Renner's Jeremy Renner, you know, yeah, it's like yeah, whatever. Yeah. Forrest Whitaker is doing the same character he always does. She's got way more range than. I'm sure she does, but I'm just guys. saying that, like in this movie, there's not a whole lot of moments where I'm like, "Wow, the acting so good," you know. It's like there's not a whole lot of moments where I am transfixed by not the ambience ambience the ambiance or or the the score or the direction of the cinematography or whatever all this stuff the ideas that i'm contemplating there wasn't really a moment in this movie where instead of all that stuff i was transfixed by the actor's performance it was more that the actor served as a perfect canvas sort of a boring blank canvas to project all of this super interesting stuff onto i think like the weight of the movie is the filmmaker carrying it but i yeah. also think that like they they did a good job like when amy adams was like experiencing all the stuff and she's like kind of comprehending the language for the first time. Like I buy that stuff. And like, I think yeah. a lesser actor could have done a worse job yeah. where, then, where then the movie has to do more to, it, to convince you. It's of one it. of those things where like when something is sufficiently good, it becomes invisible. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. I, I feel like if there was a scene, there was, there's not really a scene where someone's like, gets super pissed off and like yells at somebody or like, or like has a real realization and we see them like, Mind yeah. blown sort of moment. Yeah, like, it's not the kind of movie that uh, actors are going to get Oscars. For, yeah, exactly, for exactly. Doesn't have the right scenes. For Although that. Yep. there were some great little tiny. Oh, would I give it more? I wanted to ask you guys what would be it. What would make it a ten for you? I think I think if the 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 gen for me if if yeah it if was the just the Chinese general scene that was just like really? a little more interesting. Well, I like that. Do scene. you think that China the CCP likes this movie or doesn't like this movie? On the one hand. Kind of looks pretty dumb in the first half of the movie. On the other hand, they kind of save the day. They do, and they also look very powerful. Well, with their big military. But they're also friends with Sudan and uh, <laughs> and other nations. Well, I mean, they've, and they're, Russia, they're, they're that's the strong, a thing. they've declared themselves the, the strongest, or the Taliban have declared China their strongest allies. Yeah, so I saw that. I don't know if uh, China yeah. really gives a fuck. I, I feel like what would make this a 10 in my book is maybe a little bit more comedy, maybe a little. Really? There's a, there's a couple funny there's jokes. A, there's a couple, yeah. but like, you know, I would. There, there's like three or there's like three jokes yeah. that that actually I identify as jokes. Like yeah. there's some like wry there sarcastic be a part things where there's like some random um, ink in the air, and they're like, "What does that say?" And like, "Oh, that was just a fart." Not that. What are the that. tentacles? It's just like, but but like, or, um, the, or imagine like they go when she's first in the thing, it, like. Uh, and she sees them for the first time. It's actually like a tiny little person with like their hands like this, and they have go up and it's like a clown face or something weird. No, okay, obviously not that kind of stuff. But like the one joke that that I was like, oh, that's a good one, is when the CIA agent is like, oh, maybe it's one out of twelve pieces, uh, or or maybe it's a competition out of twelve to see who wins. And she's like, why do I have to work with? Why do I have to talk to him? Yeah, yeah. I'm like, okay, just like something yeah, like yeah, that, you know, a few more, more a few more little bits yeah. like that, or like you're just a Marvel guy, or, may, or maybe like. Uh, you know, a little bit. Well, you know, it's like it's a movie. Uh, yeah. It makes me think, and that's why I love it. It's obviously, I, I, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. So after, good. especially after the third watch and seeing all of this stuff and seeing how beautiful and tight it is, it, it would be, it would get more points for me if there was just a bit more of this like uh, fun stuff. Maybe too. the sequel. No, it's don't coming. make us. Why are you making fun, Arrival, of James? But it's two L's. <laughs> like if there was. Uh, a, <laughs> <laughs> We're back. We <laughs> forgot something. <laughs> yeah. back. We forgot there, it was one out of 24 messages. It, here's a nitpick, actually. It was, why the hell is it a 12-part message? That doesn't make any sense. Oh. That's anth antithetical to the aims of the aliens. No, it makes perfect sense. No. Because they 12 want, is significant. They want to educate the humans sufficiently to save their own hides. Why would they add in this extra thing like, well, actually, we're, here's one piece of it. Now you guys work together. I think that's, that's like... The, come on. The... To me, maybe that's a hint of it maybe not being deterministic where they know, or maybe maybe it is not, uh, but they know that if the humans don't work together, then they can't help them. Yeah. And so they have to create this this scenario where like the humans have to come together and this is like the first step so that in 3,000 years they can be a space-faring species. Right. So they have to do that uh, just to get them to work together. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it could, like that? it could be the case that even if there's, Earth only has one Louise... And she learns it all and knows everything. And she's just going on this campaign where she's trying to educate the whole world. The other nations could just be like, eh, screw you, American. They, they, <laughs> de they definitely could, yeah. yeah. You know how this movie should have ended? She like kind of like does her time travel thing and then she looks over and there's the giant space baby from 2001. <laughs> <laughs> or from Rick and Morty. From Rick and Morty, ooh, yeah. <laughs> um, what do you guys think of people that like 
hate this movie. Do you think that it's just like who hates it? It's got a lot of one star reviews. Like the one what? star, yeah, where people just think about? it's like one of the stupidest movies. Like it's so uh, pretentious. It's so uh, like it has. It's so unrealistic. It's all these things. Do you? Are you like me and you think that these people are morons? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you don't like this movie, look. Okay, you I'll can, say this. Yeah. I'll say this. That obviously movies like this aren't for everybody. There are the people who like Transformers, uh, <laughs> and this, you know, that's the bays that's, of bay. That's fine. You know, like that's your taste. That's cool. But like, you can't argue that this is a good movie. Like, if someone yeah. tries to make the case that this is not a good movie, you're just all you're doing is. Is revealing that you don't know a fucking thing about movies. Yeah, I don't. I don't find it particularly film. pretentious. And that doesn't mean you're a bad person. And they're it's just not, movies. Yeah, it's yeah, not even. Movies. I mean, it's sort of pretentious. I can see that. And like in any any film that is this deep and tight is going to be a bit pretentious. Like sure. you know, that's that's the way of the world. That's the way of art mediums. But and this is why I'm saying it would be a perfect movie if it had a little bit more of this entertainment factor, so those people could have a good time. Yeah. You know. Um, but it's a it's a one of the best sci-fi movies of all time. Like, Come on, guys. My favorite uh, quote from a one-star review is a long review, and there's a lot of people that are very passionate haters of this movie, and I'm like, what did you heck? watch the same movie as me? I don't get it, but this line kills me. Uh, so the director, I hope, will soon be looking for other work in the film <laughs> business. Perhaps he can sell the popcorn, since he's clearly not up to the job of telling a story. What? <laughs> Okay, but like the, he's clearly not okay. one of the best living directors. I will say, I will say that like you know that's that's why I have warmed up a lot more to the idea of these Marvel movies being legitimately good movies because I'm like that is a that should be a factor that directors take into account. Like how yeah. entertaining is this? How how many people are actually going to sit down and be fully engaged for two hours? No, well, I don't I, know, man. You don't. Your movie doesn't have to be all things to all people. You don't need to water. No, it down. I think not. the best movies are. Most people think they're pretty good. I just think, I it think depends I how don't you like that. That's true of this. this Most people. Yeah, I guess so. Think yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that, like, you know. And I mean, obviously, it, there are people that rubbed the wrong way, and I think that they would have liked it more if it was a bit more entertaining. Yeah. And I think, I think it's like everything where whatever mood, <laughs> whatever mood you bring in with you to the movie really does affect how you perceive it. And if you're like not in the mood to like sit there and think very deeply, like you might just be like, okay, I don't want to do this. I don't want to connect with this movie right. on this level. You have to That's, be in the yeah. mood. It's yeah. not that you're dumb if you don't like this movie. Is that I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> I some people look for different things in their I'm movies. The, this movie is chock full of the things that I look for Same. in a movie. Uh th things that can be broken down, uh things that are meaningful, things that are worthwhile to talk about. Uh and it's entertaining. It's not too long. Yeah. And it's I, a great I, movie. Wait, is that IMDb? Can you like click on that person and see what the uh, review of Fast and Furious 9 was? No, I I, <laughs> I, I copy pasted that part into the my document. I'd have to find it again. One thing but, I want to say. Twelve ships. Clock. Clock has twelve oh. things. It's like a. It's like they're time. like helping. Yeah, humans' per perception. That's of what time. I think. It, it's either that or they're Months. Jesus and the twelve disciples. Maybe it could be all of it. And th this no. is. I, I think that like when movies are. this well, good, is a Catholic. And, maybe. Well, we. Yeah. <laughs> was. I'm just kidding. I think like we've talked about this idea a little bit where you have to have a level of trust and relationship with the director, and I think we all have a very high level of trust with David Denis Villeneuve where. We start to let our brain imagine things that maybe weren't intentional, uh, and so like like that for that example, the twelve, we are carrying like well, we're we're looking for meaning because we're like maybe he put it there. We trust him enough that he could be good putting faith, it there. Benefit of the doubt, totally. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. I, this is definitely a movie that qualifies for good faith. Well, me. but it was for many people, including me, the entry point to Villeneuve for sure. A lot of people didn't see Prisoners or Enemy or In Sunday. I didn't realize that it won eight Oscars. Nominated for best. Nominated for best picture. Oh bummer. Nominated for best director, best director, best adapted screenplay, best sound mixing. Uh, yeah, and best cinematography, and best film editing, and best production design. But yeah. it won best sound editing. Oh, it should have won so many more. See, what, like, won that, what won that year? It was one of those ones. You, you know, like it's not going to win because it's sci-fi. Never wins. Man. Yeah. The I feel like just one of the one of the markers that this is such a good movie is the fact that like uh, we have talked about basically everything I had written down in my notes and I still feel like there there's more we are leaving on the table for yeah. sure I wanted to say earlier um you're talking about the merits of the cinematography and everything oh and my. it's not yeah. it's not Roger Deakins right no nope. because one of the things about in anticipation of Dune we're like well one of the things that made 
Blade Runner so awesome was Roger Deakins, and he's not going to be there, so maybe De- Dune won't be that cool. But this is not Roger Deakins, and mm-hmm. it's very cool. It's very cool, and I think like that's one of the things that didn't even have is great at is that knowing what he wanted out of this movie, and like he knew, he 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 knew very specifically. He picked that DP because of his like more natural look, and it works so well in this movie. And he picked the DP of of Dune for his his look too. So like he knows what he's doing, and like. I have the utmost faith in Denis Villeneuve. Like, honestly. I'm going to yeah. buy extra the... tickets for Dune. Just so it makes more money. <laughs> Man. I, uh, they, need, they need to make a sequel. I mean, okay. If they don't make a sequel. But, like, can you fair. imagine? Well, we'll guys, see. Maybe I'll hate it. Can you imagine a universe in which Dune is not good? Uh, don't say that. I know. I, I Get tweeted, prepared for that, I, You have to be prepared. Like, I know. You have to. I, I, I tweeted shit like that before Cyberpunk came out. I was like, like... Like, is there, yeah, is there a world in which Cyberpunk doesn't win Game oh of the Year? Like, <laughs> shit like that. It happened to Tenet. Yeah. Sitting there, and you have this cognitive dissonance. You're like, I like this, right? Totally. I still like this, right? Yeah. I was so I was so excited <laughs> for Tenet. Yeah. But Dune is another level. Not only because it's Denny Villeneuve, but, like, Dune is Dune is great. And it's Dune, a, yeah. Dune needs to... I need to fill this Star Wars-shaped void in my soul. Oh, my God, dude. I saw the, the <laughs> best meme I've... The most... Uh, you know, you ever see a meme that's, like, made for you? You're like someone made this. <laughs> they're talking. They're talking to me. It was a, someone sent me the screenshot. It was like, Dune is just Star Wars for guys who listen to Tool. <laughs> oh my God. See, Dune is that's see. It's not true though because Dune gets kind of weird and too out there after the first book. But you well, know, have you we'll, listened to the latest album? We'll find out. No, I have not. <laughs> All right, we gotta get out of here, dude. See you guys well, later. What's gonna be next week? Next week is no time to die. No, I had that. Yeah, I'm excited. James Bond. <laughs> I'm seeing it on Wednesday, and so one thing I want to do is start in- inviting people to send us emails ahead of the time, mm. especially with older movies that they've seen a lot. Like, why don't you guys discuss this aspect of the movie, which I think is really cool? I want to have more audience engagement yeah. and interaction. So why don't you guys give us that? And you can email that stuff. Email it. Don't tweet it. Email it. Uh, hello at they're just movies.com Hello. tweet at us for everything else at they're just movies no no at tjm pod yes yeah 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 sounds good james bond next week we look forward to your messages bye-bye bye love you just language man <laughs>